Hi students, this is Dr. Spellman coming to you remotely from my house. Um, this is my first video for environmental ethics, so I'm going to give it a shot, see how it goes. I've done a few others, and uh, I think I'm getting better each time, so hopefully this is an improvement on those. All right, so today we're going to talk about ecocentrism, um, but before we do that, I just want to spend a little bit of time revisiting what we talked about last time, uh, in particular last week. So um, generally speaking, we talked about biocentrism. What is biocentrism? Biocentrism is the view that all living things are directly morally considerable. Uh, that is to say that we need to take them into account when we're figuring out what we should do. And we also looked at some arguments for biocentrism. In particular, we looked at three different arguments. One argument uh, from the best theory of welfare. So it's the best theory of welfare is one in which all living things have welfare, therefore they have interests. And, uh, satisfying those interests, that makes the world better. There's the last person argument. Um, would it be okay to cut down the last living redwood? It seems like it wouldn't be. So that seems like it must uh, be because uh, redwoods or trees or something like that have intrinsic value. And there's the bare difference argument. A world with no life on it seems worse than a world where there is life on it. There are also We also looked at some objections to biocentrism. So one of those objections was that biocentrism entails that it's wrong to kill plants. And we looked at how Gary Varner sort of responded to that objection and explained why even if you're a biocentrist, you don't have to say that it's wrong to kill or harm plants. Sometimes that's justifiable. Uh, we also looked at an objection according to which biocentrism entails that it's no worse to harm natural woods than cultivated ones or rare organisms than common ones. Um, it does seem intuitive that harming a natural wood or a rare organism uh, is worse than harming a cultivated one or a common one. Um, but again, Varner had some responses to that sort of thought, well, natural woods, rare organisms, these things are, are going to be valuable uh, to human flourishing down the line. So they're sort of intrinsically, sorry, they're not intrinsically valuable, but they're instrumentally valuable. And that would explain why it's worse to harm natural woods and rare organisms, even though there's not any special value to those things. And finally, we sort of ended with this question about should natural objects have legal rights? Um, should we give rivers or forests uh, rights so that people can sue uh, others in court or basically defend uh, those natural objects, those natural resources. So that was where we uh, were last week. This week we're going to turn to another view, an uh, environmentalist style view um, called ecocentrism. And to do that we're going to look at Aldo Leopold's The Land Ethic. Now this is a really influential paper uh, in environmental ethics. Uh, it was a big deal. It sort of started this whole uh, theory of ecocentrism, and so uh, it's worth taking a closer look at that paper. In general, uh, we want to ask whenever we're reading any paper, you know, what's the author's thesis? What are they trying to convince us of? And what Leopold says is that while we have an ethic that governs the relationship between individuals um, and an ethic that governs uh, the relationship between individuals and society. We don't have an ethic that governs the relationship between individuals and the land. And that's something we need. We need an ethic to govern that relationship between individuals and the land. Um, according to Leopold, that ethic is called the land ethic. And it should be one on which the rightness or wrongness of an act depends on how it affects the biotic community or the ecosystem. So he talks a little bit about how um, in the past we got something like the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, right, that tell us how to treat individuals. We've got the Golden Rule that talks about sort of how we should interact with society. But we need a land ethic uh, to tell us how we should interact with the environment. Early on, uh, Leopold says this. I think this is sort of a nice quote to, to get at the, the thrust of his, uh, his argument, his, his view. 
So he says a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to a plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. Here what Leopold's saying is like, humans aren't special. They're not some unique conqueror of the land. That's not their job. Rather, they're a community member. They're part of it. And so we need to respect uh, the land, the other people who are part of the uh, biotic community, the ecosystem, and we also need to respect the community as such. And so here I've sort of highlighted the last part of that uh, sentence, and also respect for the community as such. That's going to, we're going to talk about ecocentrism as being a holist view, and it's that part right at the end that makes it holist. So the respect for fellow members, right, any, the biocentrist, um, the sentientist can sort of say, we've got to respect other individuals, but it's this respect for the community as a whole that makes ecocentrism a special uh, kind of view that's different than the ones we've looked at so far. Uh, so let's talk about ecocentrism. Ecocentrism is the view that biotic communities are directly morally considerable. So the focus here is not on individuals, but on the community. And for Leopold, it's doing what's best for the community, not necessarily what's best for the individuals in it. Ecocentrism is a holist view. To say that it's a holist view is to say that groups of individuals or collectives can be morally considerable uh, directly, uh, not just indirectly. So the thought is, again, when we're acting, we don't think about the particular birds that we're uh, harming. We think of the ecosystem that they're a part of. And what makes it wrong to harm individual bird birds is that it harms the ecosystem that they're in, not so much because it harms the particular birds. Now, this notion of a biotic community is one that's really important to Leopold. Um, it's sort of playing a central role in his theory. And so what is a biotic commu community? Uh, according to Leopold, it's a community of interdependent organisms. So we've got this uh, little pyramid here, and this is kind of like what Leopold has in mind when he talks about the biotic pyramid. I'll say in a second why it's not exactly a, a perfect model, but um, you can see down here at the bottom, right, we have uh, worms and other sort of insects uh, growing in the ground, uh, in the soil. And that soil is going to produce plants that grow uh, out of it. So they're sort of fertilizing in a way the soil, and that fertilizing allows plants to grow. Um, then we have bugs that are sort of eating the plants, uh, crawling around in them. The plants are the habitat for those bugs, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we've got on top of that, we've got a chicken and a pig and a cow that uh, I think... The suggestion here is maybe that, that chickens and pigs and cows eat these uh, insects. Now that's not, uh, I mean, that's kind of true. Um, you know, chickens definitely are going to eat insects, but cows are not, they're not going after the insects, right? They might eat insects sort of incidentally. Um, but then we've got humans up on top that uh, the suggestion here is that humans eat the animals. Um, it's important to note that for Leopold, he doesn't sort of see the pyramid in quite this way. So he says that humans are in a sort of intermediate position. Uh, he says that we're with raccoons and squirrels um, that eat both plants and uh, animals. So um, I think this is a little bit misleading if we're thinking about it. Leopold's view, um, humans aren't necessarily at the top. That implies a kind of like anthropocentrist idea that Leopold um, doesn't hold. Another nice point that Leopold makes is that, um, sorry, other direction. So um, in the past, we had this, uh, a pyramid that had soil at the bottom, oak trees uh, above that, deer above that, and then Native Americans. Sort of in the North, uh, North America, that was what the biotic community was like. But we've transformed that biotic community to a different one right? One where soil is still at the bottom, but the main crop isn't, you know, tree, oak trees, it's corn. That's the main thing that we're uh, growing. 
because it's easy to produce a lot of it. And we're feeding that to cows, right, because uh, we like to eat cows, they're tasty. And uh, even though cows don't aren't really made to eat corn, um, the fact that it's so easy to grow and we can make so much of it, um, that's what we're doing. And so we've got the soil, corn, cow, and then the farmer, the farmer's eating cows rather than a deer or something like that. And so um, I think this is a nice point about sort of how we've how we've transformed the land that we're living on um, into an entirely different kind of, of pyramid. Leopold also has a section on uh, titled The Land is an Energy Circuit. So he thinks about land as not merely soil, right? It's energy. Um, the native plants and animals kept the energy circuit open, but others might not. So when we think back to the corn uh, growing in the soil, maybe that corn is depriving the soil of minerals that like oak trees didn't. And maybe sort of like the sort of diversity of organisms that we had in the past uh, was good and important. And if we just put corn everywhere, then we're going to destroy that uh, energy circuit. Uh, finally, three, man-made changes are of, of a different order than evolutionary changes and have effects more comprehensive than is intended or foreseen. So when humans make changes to the energy circuit, they're more dramatic. Um, they have a, a more significant effect than we anticipate them having. Um, one, you know, right now we're dealing with the coronavirus and the, the thought is like, we're not necessarily great at reasoning about how this is going to impact us. And so the downstream effects are things that we can't, we're not always good at foreseeing. Um, nature is a little bit better at this. So uh, he, he worries that when, we, when we're changing the land, we're going to make these dramatic changes. We don't see the effects they're going to have, and then it's going to be too late. He also talks about how some biotas are more resilient than others, and I think this is just sort of an interesting idea that I hadn't thought much about, um, but that some sort of areas or parts of the world are more resistant, uh, resilient in the face of changes uh, than others. So, uh, you know, we might think he talks about sort of the Northeast as being relatively resilient, Northeast of the United States as being relatively resilient, and the Northwest similarly but like the Southwest is less resilient and, and can be much easy, easier, uh, it's easier to destroy. Um, in light of this, Leopold just notes that the less dramatic the man-made changes we make, the greater probability it is that the biota, the biota community, will be able to readjust to those changes. All right, so we've got sort of a sense for Leopold's view now we're going to lead right up into uh, the land ethic. So what's the response? What, how, how do we respond to the changes and the, the, the changes that we've been making to the world? How should we be thinking about the world, not how have we been thinking about it? So Leopold says, the most serious obstacle impeding the evolution of the land ethic is the fact that our educational and economic system is headed away from rather than toward an intense consciousness of the land. Your true modern is separated from the land by many middlemen and by innumerable physical gadgets. So, right, we, we aren't on the land, right? We're driving in cars over streets. We're, uh, in a way, not really engaged. We're not touching. We're not smelling. We're not walking on the land anymore. Um, we've, got, we've got our shoes. Uh, we, we, we've sort of separated ourselves from nature. Um, We've got chemicals to make our, our lawns uh, free and clear of weeds or anything that, we, that doesn't look pretty, right? We not, we're not really connected to the land like we used to be. In this quote, Leopold's expressing uh, a kind of techno-pessimism, right? The gadgets separate us from the land, and that's bad. Um, techno-pessimism, just the view that technology is bad for society and the environment. This stands in contrast with the kind of techno-optimism, the view that technology is generally speaking good for society and the environment. And this is some, an idea that's going to come back up when we talk about deep ecology uh, next time. 
Leopold says, man has no vital relation to it, the land. Right? To him, the land is a space between cities on which crops grow. Turn him loose for a day on the land, and if the spot does not happen to be a golf links or a scenic area, he is bored stiff. And I think something like that's true, right? When we think about Ada, we say, we're in the middle of the cornfields, we're in the middle of nowhere, and there's nothing here, right? But Leopold's, I think, suggesting that that's not really true, right? It's maybe not the most exciting, uh, interesting thing, uh, biotic community ever, but um, if we looked closer, right, we would find and learn to appreciate what is interesting and exciting about it. Moving from Colorado, it's like the mountains are dramatic and, and the hills and, and uh, the wildlife's different. You know, there's a way in which like that has a kind of mystique. We're not, uh, the thought of hiking in Colorado is exciting, the thought of hiking in Ohio, not so exciting. But Leopold's saying, you know, we don't need to be bored by the environments around us. Uh, it is exciting if we learn to appreciate it. The key log, uh, Leopold says, which has to be removed to release the evolutionary process for the land ethic is this. We need to quit thinking about decent land use as solely an economic problem. Not, shouldn't be and, but an economic problem. He says, examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what's economically expedient. Now, Leopold doesn't think, like, we should just ignore economics, but he is saying that, like, economics is one among other factors that we should be considering. Uh, so we need to consider sort of the ethical issues about what we're doing to the land, not just is this good for business. So when a farmer uh, tills an entire field or... or um, you know, heaven forbid, right, like destroys a, a forest to grow more corn or something like that. Leopold saying, well, you're just thinking about that field in term, terms of its economic output for you. You're not thinking about the aesthetics of it. You're not thinking about the ethics of it. You're not thinking about how that field was important to the biotic community. All right, and that leads us to this quote, um, which expresses the land ethic that Leopold is endorsing. He says, a thing is right, and here I think he means morally right, when it tends to preserve the integrity, the stability, and the beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. So an act is right when it preserves the integrity, the stability, and the beauty of the biotic community. This is the land ethic um, that Leopold holds, and this is the way we might put the ecocentrist view. Um, ecocentrists are going to think the actions are right when they preserve the stability, right, of the biotic community that we have. What's Leopold's argument for this? So first, the first premise of the argument is that morality requires us to be good members of our communities. Second, he thinks we're members of biotic communities. And if we take those two premises together, what do we get? Right? We get the conclusion that morality requires us to be good members of our biotic communities. Okay, so we've got that. We've got to be good members of our biotic communities, but what does that entail? Right? What does that involve? Being a good member of a biotic community, the Leopold involves preserving the integrity, stability, and beauty of that community, right? If we think about our communities that we have um, as people, right, our society, right, we want that society to have integrity, we want it to be stable, um, and we want to promote its beauty. Um, it's maybe hard to know exactly what counts as beautiful or is beauty subjective or not. That's a tricky question that we're not gonna jump into, but it's, it's worth considering. Um, but when we think about something like, you know, coronavirus is dominating our attention right now, you might think, um, well, the good thing, the right thing to do as members of society is to do what's going to be best for the integrity, stability of the community. And that means, you know, quarantine ourselves in our rooms or, or whatever, and practicing social distancing, that sort of thing. Same with the biotic community. Whatever is going to promote the flourishing of that biotic community is the right thing, to, is, is, is what it takes to be a good member of the community. The conclusion then is that morality requires us to preserve 
the integrity, stability, and beauty of our biotic communities. And if that's true, then egocentrism is true. All right, so that is the end of Leopold's argument. Now I want to take a look at some implications of Leopold's view. So we might ask, is Leopold correct that the actions the actions are right if and only if they tend to preserve the integrity, stability, and diversity of biotic communities. If so, what follows from this? So let's look at a few of the of the kind of actions that we've we've looked at so far. So one is factory farming. I think here we've got an image of, of a cattle farm, right? And the thought is, is this promoting the integrity, stability, and beauty? of the biotic community. And I think uh, naturally we'd be inclined to say, no, this, this isn't really pr preserving or, or benefiting that. But for an ecocentrist, right, there's nothing necessarily wrong with harming animals or using animals, as long as those animals are promoting uh, the interests of the biotic community. So while factory farming might not be wrong, something like humane farming could be permissible, especially if it's sort of restoring the land. Um, there's a movement towards restorative agriculture, right? And that movement is going to say like, yeah, farming is good because it's good. Uh, humane farming is maybe good because it's um, having a positive impact on the environment. Uh, zoos. So zoos are something where like the animal rights activist is going to think, well, this is really problematic, right? We've got these lions and cages, they, they can't escape, um, they probably don't have much room to roam around, uh, and, and that's wrong to, to use animals in that way. But if you're an environmentalist, an ecocentrist like Leopold, and you think, well, keeping these lions here is going to raise some money for conservation, and we can use that money to, to protect lions elsewhere, protect the environment elsewhere, then it's worth it. And so an ecocentrist view is going to think that that um, zoos are perfectly fine. And I think this is kind of a view that, that some of you are sympathetic to when we have that discussion about zoos. Uh, think about bullfighting, right? Is bullfighting okay according to ecocentrism? Well, it's not obviously wrong. Um, you know, one bull here and there, right? Even, you know, a few hundred bulls uh, killing them is not really having any significant positive or negative impact on the on the ecosystem maybe even if we think like well bullfighting preserves uh, this species of animal uh, if we've got them out in some like natural area where they're they're promoting the integrity stability and beauty of the the biotic community well then hey sure bullfighting is fine um, but i think in general the ecocentrist is like and eh, there's nothing nothing too interesting to see here, um, bullfighting shouldn't be like a significant problem uh, for the for the ecocentrist. The last thing I want to talk about is the elephant management dilemma. So, um, in Africa, we've got elephants. We've got these baobab uh, trees uh, in Kruger National Park, in particular. Uh, Ian John White uh, managed Kruger National Park. And he sort of said, we've got this problem. We've got elephants on the one hand, which are a keystone species. They're really important uh, for the ecosystem. And we've got these baobab trees, which are also really important for the ecosystem. But what they found uh, in this park and what's still going on is that elephants are really good at eating a bunch of different things, uh, including, I guess, the bark of these trees. And so uh, here you've got an image of a, a baby elephant, but you can see the kind of damage uh, that elephants are doing to these uh, trees here. And so the question is, well, what do we do? This baobab tree is really important for certain species, and so we need to protect it. But we also want to protect the elephants, and if the elephants sort of eat all of their available resources, then that's going to be really bad uh, for the elephant populations, but also any sort of living things that lived in those resources that, that depended on the baobab trees or, or other plants. And so here's sort of White expressing the kind of dilemma that, 
that elephant managers were in, says if the objective of a national park is the long-term conservation of all the indigenous biota occurring there, then something will ultimately have to be done to limit the number of elephants. As the elephant population grows, they destroy the other things around, and there's no sort of natural predator, right? There's nothing to kill off the elephants. He sort of speculates in this paper. He's like, you know, it's unclear why elephants didn't just take over everything. Um, maybe, you know, humans in the past had been killing elephants, and that's what kept the elephant population in check. But in something like a national park where we're not killing elephants, um, their numbers are just growing too large, uh, and they're harming the, the ecosystem. So that gives us kind of a, a dilemma. What, what do we do to solve this problem? Like, do we not kill any elephants and just let their population go unchecked, which is going to destroy the environment and, and then uh, ultimately be bad for the elephants? Or should we, you know, kill the elephants? Should we expand their range? Should we move them to different locations? And as we go through this list, one, two, three, and four, we find that none of the options is really uh, all that satisfying. So range expansion, we might widen the national park, but then the same problem is just going to happen. We're just delaying the inevitable, right? Elephants are going to um, outgrow that. They're going to use up all the resources, and that's a problem. We could move the elephants right to different locations, different national parks, but again, the same problem is going to arise. Uh, they're going to take over. They're going to eat all the the plants, and uh, then uh, they're going to destroy the local ecosystem there. Contraception is one option, right? That you might think the animal rights activist or uh, advocate is going to to be sympathetic to, but contraception. Contraception is really expensive in elephants. Um, you've got to continually uh, sort of be giving the elephants the contraceptives. They're expensive. And so you might think, well, we just don't have the resources to do the kind of contraceptive work that would need to be done in order to uh, limit the elephant population. It's also sort of, um, you might think that in itself, giving elephants contraceptives is, is a kind of rights violation, potentially, if you're an animal. Um, uh, animal rights advocate. So finally that leaves us at culling, and uh, that is killing elephants, and while that seems distasteful, it does seem like it might be the thing that we need to do, especially if we're ecocentrist, right? If we're animal rights advocates, we're not going to be into culling, but if we're, um, if we're ecocentrist, then culling isn't that bad, right? It's the thing that we need to do to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. And so that's uh, the, the ecocentrist uh, conclusion. Uh, one last note, um, we, when we think about ecocentrism, we might think, well, here's what's really destroying the ecosystem. It's people. There are just so many of them. And, and we're the real environmental problem. And so one criticism of Leopold's view is that it seems to entail that it's okay to kill off humans because that would actually be best for the, the biotic community, the ecosystem, uh, the world, right? Um, and insofar as, as uh, killing humans, reducing the population dramatically is good for the ecosystem, then Leopold thinks it's right. So sort of as you're thinking about this uh, view, that's one sort of potential worry that you want to keep in mind. All right, so that's the end of our lecture for today. For next time, for Wednesday, we're going to be looking at chapter 12 of our textbook and this view called Deep Ecology. Uh, we'll catch you later.